Hey. We're on. Greetings. And thanks to everybody who's watching or going to watch. And we're going to get started today talking about Pet Project Christian Nationalism and and more importantly, certain events that are going to be happening right here in Coos County that we should all be alerted to. And so I'm here with my co-host, Israel and Jurek. And my name is Mary Jedry. And I think we need to do a little housekeeping real quick. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I just spoke about the background of candidate for North Bend School Board, Charlotte Hutt. I didn't misspeak about how awesome she is, just about <laughs> her background. She hadn't worked as an educator in that district, but okay. she did work in in education prior to her candidacies. And of course, you can find all of this information at her website. So I just wanted to clarify that, that Charlotte Hutt was not a North Bend School District educator but she is, was a career educator as her background. But aside from all that, she is the perfect person for the job. Mm -hmm. so. Absolutely. So we're going to talk today about something that I've written about on the blog several times and that I have a deep concern about. And it is this rise of Christian nationalism, religious fascism, however you want to name it and we do have unfortunately a fairly solid little block of nationalists right here in coos county and they are infiltr infiltrating is probably not the right word but they are attempting to get on a lot of nonpartisan boards school boards port commissions transportation boards and so forth and yeah um, infiltration suggests we got some degree of secrecy i think that there's an open attempt pretty to take open over. about it yeah yeah it's a, it seems to be yeah. an over open attempt to take over these uh, these boards and, and positions and then leverage yeah. them for political power and uh, and to enforce christian uh, the, uh, their brand of christian principles and values on the rest of society yeah, so I, I don't think I don't think they're seeking these positions to serve the district, work on infrastructure and funding and so forth. I think they're primarily to shift how people feel about themselves and what's acceptable, banning books and just this intolerance for uh, anybody who's not in their little sphere of sexuality or religiosity or political bent. And, and unfortunately, we've got a county commissioner, Rod Taylor, who is, as far as I can tell, a full-blown Christian nationalists and um, so what and, uh, we're talking about the subject of, you know, of Christian nationalism and we're going to be talking about the Faith Fest event which is a political event with a Christian veneer on it coming up in Bandon at Restoration Worship Center so what is in your understanding of Christian nationalism and your re your review of, of the activities of the citizens restoring liberty what is Christian nationalism to you what does it mean to be a for someone to be a Christian nationalist? How do you, how do we know that, for example, Rod Taylor or someone like, or the Restoration Worship Center are involved in Christian nationalism? Uh, first of all, I see it as very authoritarian. And in my view, it uses, like you said, a veneer of, of religiosity, but I don't think it's really very religious at all. But nationalism, to me, it's, first of all, it's typically traditionally racist. 
and it's authoritarian and and it's it i think it's meant to subvert it is it, meant to create i believe a one size fits all approach to society and they get to pick the size <laughs> that's a very that's not a very scientific explanation <laughs> it sounds, but it's a little bit nebulous there <laughs> maybe i'll give it a I, shot <laughs> oh you can give a shot at it but i would like to say i wasn't actually prepared for that part of the oh, question i'm sorry <laughs> but i feel i do know that this organism this church uh, in Bandon, the restoration worship center international espouses a lot of the views of the sort of MAGA right and um, pro pro gun and anti LGBTQ approach to society. And for example, Rod Taylor, when he, his first action as a commissioner was to try and enforce and force prayer. Right. On, I think that's a quintessential on, example of the way Christian nationalism operates in the political sphere. Yeah. So he, <clears throat> when he won and he was interviewed some on whatever station or whatever it was, he said that he was ideologically very different from his predecessor, which was Melissa Cribbins. And we would, we were going to see some big changes. Now, I see that as him not fully understanding the job that he's taken on and he's demonstrated more than once that he doesn't actually know what the commissioners are supposed to do. But I also see it as him, just like when he was participating in the January 6th insurrection, I see him as wanting to force his beliefs on the rest of us. That and seems to be pretty consistent with how na Christian nationalism operates in our political system and society. And as a pro-democracy project, we're talking about it because it influences our community. Our local community is being influenced by a subset of uh, the political discourse that has the veneer of, of faith and, uh, and tradition, but is predomin predominantly fringe far right politics packaged neatly and uh, and then uh, distributed through the well-intentioned hands and hearts of people of faith in our community mm -hmm. and and so we see that kind of push to try to rather than to try to have government and and uh, and and civil leadership serve the entire public as we are it seems to be interested in serving the interests of this p political and religious agenda and to conform society to that political and religious agenda. Um, so it does, it does have that authoritarian streak. It does have that tendency to, uh, um, and it has that inevitability of closely aligning the politics with a particular religious perspective and point of view and and moral claims so i think the word that i earlier is christian nationalism christian or otherwise is anti-democratic yeah um by yeah. its nature mm -hmm. and um in pro-democracy here. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. <laughs> we definitely believe that our society should be a place where Christians are free to practice and uh, and share their faith. Um, but we also believe that this is a, a society should be open for people to not have to practice 
the faith or the religious limitations and restrictions that Christians have for themselves in their own community. In other words, people should be free. And, um, and uh, it does seem like more and more the Christian nationalists across our country are trying to limit the freedom of others who are not part of their religious tradition, re restricting parents' rights, restricting women's reproductive rights, and imposing uh, religious instruction and education in schools, uh, religious symbols and things like that. And so you, know, you see the Ten Commandments being required to be posted in Texas schools along with yeah. dis displays of in God we trust and things like that. Uh, we just see this like effort on the part of this religious, this smaller religious movement to try to impose its will on the democratic community at large. I would also point out that Rod Taylor, for example, in some photographs, which someday I'll be smart enough to overlay those while we're talking and people can look. <laughs> but there's some photographs of him at the uh, yeah, at the Capitol, and he's holding a sign, and it's so cliche, really. He's got. He's got a banner that he's holding with two hands, and in his left hand, he's in addition to the banner, he's holding the, the United States flag. But the banner on one side, anyway, says, fight like Flynn. And he's talking about, I'm pretty sure, Michael Flynn, General Michael Flynn, who was just a phenomenal traitor. But Flynn himself has said that it isn't just one nation under God. It should be one religion under the nation. He's a proponent of a single religion. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether Rod Taylor's aware of that or why, I can't imagine why anybody mm -hmm. who's a patriot would, would hold anything well, up I mean, with when you look Michael at Michael Flynn yeah. on there, but yeah. When you look at the video of the people that took that assaulted and invaded the Capitol building that day, when they get into the chambers, they are making decla religious declarations, claiming oh, those chambers for Jesus Christ and things like yeah. that. It was yeah. very much, January 6th is, a, is an exam a quintessential example of the, the in interest and design that Christian nationalism has over our country, that they're not interested in free and fair elections, that they're not interested in, they're willing to accept election lies and conspiracy theories and all of those kinds of things, anything that can be a vehicle for their access to political power because they are primarily a political power movement. Their, um, their allegiance to and connection to the Christian tradition is parasitic they're interested in the christian in, in the church and in christians in the same way that like multi-level marketing companies are interested in the christian church and christians it's because the christian church and christians pr provide a very open market to their ideas and their movement and they're gullible they're susceptible to some of the lies and things because they don't necessarily do their own critical thinking they rely on the perspectives and opinions of their own religious leaders and some of those, them have their own political agenda or economic agenda or they themselves are not trained in critical thinking and aren't necessarily willing to challenge some of the things that are coming their way from their political allies and so yeah christian nationalism i think is a pretty parasitic political movement that's co-opting the uh, conservative christian church yeah yeah now you and i you were more gracious about Rod Taylor when we were having a private discussion I'm, a while back. Yeah, I'm generally going to be more, this is part of like how I approach even my adversaries. <laughs> <laughs> to be a, but I don't mind if you want to level level some heavy criticism that way. I'll just have a different, sometimes a different perspective yeah. and we can share them both here. Yeah, It's an open yeah. forum. I you, I think what you said is that you thought that he was genuinely 
I don't know, maybe genuinely even a person of faith, or something of that nature. And I guess I just don't, I just don't see it. I just don't feel it. Mm -hmm. He uses the language, he uses the words. But it, to me, it's more like a prop. And, yeah. um, and it's, and, and I, you know, maybe it's a question of rationality rather than faith is one thing being clinical and rational or it's not that they can't reside together, but they don't necessarily reside together. And I, I can't rationalize this loving God, yeah. be with, God be with you thing with a guy <sighs> who, who uses his, carries a gun and starts an argument with somebody and then flicks his holster and puts his hand on his gun to be menacing. And, or someone who goes off with a bullhorn in front of a family home and screaming at these people because they reported a business for unsafe practices during the pandemic. So I, so I just can't get, I just yeah, don't, yeah. I don't it know seems if like there's... fate's got anything to do with him. I think it's just a convenient, but maybe I'm wrong. And I think we're, what we're dealing with is this, this, I, 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 I'll, I'll disclose, I, I served as a, a Lutheran pastor for the last six, six and a half years from 2015 to 2021 here in, in North Bend, Oregon. I do have some familiarity with the Christian faith, extensive familiarity of working, studying religion and working in ministry since 2000, 2005. Um, and, uh, and so I think what we're looking at here is as a person who in their public life and discourse, they're not always exemplars of the faith that they actually believe in. Um, mm -hmm. And it's very easy when you are being, what do you call it? I mean, when you're being infiltrated by this, this nationalist movement, this kind of parasitic movement, that it's going to draw out parts of you as a person that might not be true to the faith that you hold, but mm -hmm. you might not recognize that in the moment because it does, it appeals to your emotions. It appeals to primarily to your fears. And then, and then it pulls you out into the public sphere on that basis, rather than on the basis of the faith or hope or love that he might have ha have in his heart. And so it then takes someone's good intentions and then it corrupts them into some kind of public activity that might actually be harmful or hurtful to those around him. And so, I, so where I'm gracious is that I do think that Rod Taylor is a genuine, person of faith. He really does believe in the Christian faith. He really does desire and hold what he believes to be a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I think that, I think that he has good intentions in his heart. That's mm -hmm. what I think. What I think happens though, is that because they're not guided by wisdom, because they're not guided by in, in accurate information about not only how things work in our society, but also accurate information about his own religious tradition and its history in the American, in, in American society, that he can very easily fall into habits and patterns that are consistent with how Christianity has aired in the past. And now with this strong pull of nationalism on the far right, the strong pull towards fascism that's happening over there. I think that he's not prepared to weather that without he's just, he's falling into it very easily. He's falling into the conspiracy theories associated with it. And he's falling into the, the political misinformation and all of that kind of stuff, which is includes election conspiracies and things like that. And so I think what you have is you have this person 
who otherwise has a good heart, who otherwise has good intentions and is being misled and being misinformed and th thoroughly believes in that misinformation to the point where he's spreading it at him, his himself. And so other people are getting infected with it as well. So that's my perception, my read on, on Mr. Taylor as a commissioner. I don't think that, I think there are people like um, in the Christian nationalist movement who are grifters. I think Flynn is, Mike Flynn is one of those grifters who, mm -hmm. who uses the uh, QAnon language and the Christian language and all of that sort of thing. But I really think that he's, he's not himself that devoted to the faith. And I, you know, Joey Gibson, I think would be another example of that. Whereas I think someone like Vance Day, who's also a scheduled speaker at the Faith Fest, is a person of faith. He's a gen general, genuinely committed to his faith tradition. And then he's been misguided and indoctrinated by the, the far right politics that he's been involved in since the 90s, at least. Um, just so, how things are when you blend religion and politics. <laughs> politics so is an it, ugly business and it does absolutely interfere and infect people's good intentions and turns them towards inadvertently nefarious things. Yeah. I think we're, one of the things that I've noticed about This group, the Restoration Worship, and, and I can't Citizens some, Restoring Liberty, and Citizens Restoring Liberty, uh, mm -hmm. and they seem to go hand in hand. I, for some reason, I can't get to that page anymore, and their uh, menu links aren't working. But anyway, they had, a, you know, how it's hard always sometimes to, to create an acronym that works with stuff, but. The, this concept that they push is obedience to God. And then somebody has to interpret what God wants you to obey today, which I guess would be the pastor who's got this <laughs> direct line. And the other thing that they had on there is, I think they were trying to use the acronym prepare and so they were probably scrambling in the weeds to find words that, you know, but under A, they had assimilate members to the group. Now, I don't know if you're old enough to remember uh, Star Trek, but there, there was the Borg, the Borg and everything, yeah. The Borg Collective, yeah. Uh Yes, yeah. the first thing that came to mind was that they were going to be assimilated by the board collective, which was just, you know, maybe they yeah. didn't find enough. Yeah, the thing about the Christian faith is that it is, since its inception, if we talk about it from the framework of the Christian narrative, from the holiday of Pentecost, when the when the Christians believe that the, the Holy Spirit comes on all of these people, and they're speaking all these different Christianity has been a multicultural, multi-language, multi-ethnic, universal in the, we could call it Catholic in the creed, faith. It, it, is, it has been uh, translated into cultures all over the world before colonialism. Right. What happened with colonialism is that Christianity in Western Europe took on a distinctively Western European cultural system and then blended it with Christianity and then spread that around the world as its kind of missionary evangelical kind of push. Mm -hmm. And so what we see now with Christian nationalism is we see this devotion to Western culture, traditional Western culture with its, and this is where we see parallels or affinity between Christian nationalist groups and white white nationalist groups is that their allegiance to Western culture, their allegiance to Western traditionalism is, it's aligned. They have common interest. And, and Christians who are raised in that tradition don't necessarily recognize the difference between 
their faith and the gospel narrative and their culture that, that's been blended with the Western cultural narrative. And they don't right. recognize how those might not be compatible or how those might be different. They equate one with the other. And Christian, mm-hmm. nationalism, Christian nationalism does this in, in hyperdrive, in overdrive. And so Christian nationalist groups like Citizens Restoring Liberty and Christian nationalist churches like Restoration Worship Center are going to be very devoted to these kinds of cultural ideas that are aligned with traditional Western culturalism, including capitalism as an economic system, which itself is ha, has values that are antithetical to who Jesus is mm-hmm. and what he teaches, and uh, and including colonialism and that uh, the idea of colonization and 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 uh, imperial expansion that is then part of their culture and tradition as an evangelical a part of the evangelical movement so they are absolutely trying to assimilate people into their religious belief and into the culture associated associated with that belief in the western conservative evangelical christian tradition so i think the assimilation is a very accurate word for that <laughs> and in the same case in the same case there that in, involves then a, an attempt to take over the reins of government and then to have government itself be a vehicle for this process, this uh, what they consider to be the, their interpretation of the commission to go and make disciples. They're interested in actually using state institutions, all cultural institutions, every possible institution of society to try to do that. Um, mm-hmm. And that desire and that evangelical desire that the evangelical church has then is ripe for a nationalist movement like christian nationalism which is primarily a political movement to come over to piggyback onto it to be a parasite on that and then try to steer that vehicle towards its own ends which are not necessarily improve increasing people's like spiritual life and connection with god in the christian tradition but rather in interested in political power and achieving its own political policy agendas over uh, all over all of society and they're going to use the the church as the vehicle to do that that's christian nationalism so so the other thing that they also talked about procreate of course and then (laughs) prosper prosper through obedience and i do think that i see this kind of overlying theme that if you're good and behave you will also prosper Mm -hmm. but it it also prepare itself is like you have to be there's still this kind of armageddon like even the faith fest website has this kind of moonscape um apocalyptic like black and white stuff i think it's the yeah <laughs> we should definitely talk about that as a facet so one of the ways in which i think evangelical and conservative christianity lends itself as a a ready host for parasitic movements like christian nationalism is that they operate with a moral system that is rooted in this kind of up and down kind of authority um that we're talking about with obedience that what is right and wrong depends on what god tells you is right and wrong and that if you do what god tells you when they use the bible as the basis for understanding what god's saying and then they're christian pastors who have been trained in bible colleges to interpret that for you and uh, if you do that then you are acting in righteousness that's their basis for righteousness or ethical behavior or moral behavior is this kind of top-down authoritarian model that that makes them not necessarily think critically about the lateral effect of their behavior and whether it's harmful or beneficial it's is it obedient and dutiful that is the concern of ethics is it obedient is it dutiful we have a very different understanding i think in in some of the mainline protestant churches and in some catholic roman catholic traditions of looking at ethics and morality laterally um how does it affect my neighbor? Is my neighbor being benefited or harmed by my behavior and my activity? 
and this is where I think you see these two different theological, the Bible doesn't speak univocally. There's two different theological trends, at least, that's way more than that, but to, at least two yeah. different theological trends in the Bible that talk about, about morality. And you can see this coming to play in, in, in letters from Paul, like when he's trying to teach his listeners in the early church about theology and he's making a major theological shift from a legalism legalistic point of view of if you follow this law then you're righteous if you don't follow this law you're unrighteous and he tries to shift that towards a lateral ethics a lateral morality and he says in in echoing the teachings of jesus he says love fulfills the law so this recognition that how we treat our neighbor and what benefits them and what harms them is what we need to be focusing on if we're considering what's moral, what's good, what's ethical. But that's lost on this kind of lateral morality kind of perspective where it's very legalistic. It's very oriented towards authoritarian obedience rather than mm -hmm. towards the, this kind of empathic, compassionate, outward look towards one's neighbor's, one's neighbor's needs. And, uh, and so those di that, that difference means that with that authoritarian obedience model of morality and ethics, they're very susceptible to movements like nationalism, Christian nationalism to come in and take it. it it's an authoritarian model. You have strong men kind of leaders. Donald Trump's an example of them. Ron DeSantis is an example of them who aren't themselves that, you know, the, the, trained in, in, in the faith or real, they're not people of, of faith. They're just not, yeah. Um, yeah. but they are, their authorities and yeah. because their authorities and because they have these political alignments that align with the conservative evangelical church they're ready to take over those that that religious institution and then turn it towards their political ends and that's yeah. again that's christian nationalism and when you get back into this whole authoritarian thing um i mean it was like g gordon liddy he could rationalize what he did during Watergate because an authority told him it was okay. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's the same thing when you're at war, um, it's okay to kill those people because your general said, kill those people. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that even Donald Trump he gives them permission to behave badly <laughs> for, right. for lack of a, right. he, to, yeah. to embrace their more base instincts rather than he he doesn't encourage them to be their best self he, right. he, he gives them he and people like him give them permission or give us permission to just be, behave badly. I, I right. Know. And I think you, you bring up a very interesting point with the military and the um, orders given in the chain of command and that sort of thing, because different institutions in our society are going to function on different structures. The military and its chain of command system is because of its particular function, it has to operate with that kind of authoritarian model. But we're a democratic society. We have different kinds of institutions that function uh, to hold a democratic society together. And that means a more lateral understanding of how we do authority. The government is for the people, by the people, of the people, for the people, and by the people. And in the church, to recognize the role of the church in society, there's some there's debate within the church on, on how it then should function and operate. Should it have more of this kind of mil militaristic chain of command kind of mentality when it thinks about its authority? And uh, and I think we we have some some history. It's an it's a two thousand year old institution. We have some history of that as it became adopted by the Roman Empire as the official state religion and then ultimately evolved into the Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic churches, you have these very authoritarian models of church structure and leadership, and then therefore role in society. But we're a democratic society. Since the American Revolution, there's been a, 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 a transition from authoritarian and aristocratic models of leadership into much more democratic 
and egalitarian models, collective leadership, and mm -hmm. um, for the church to function in this society as this kind of authoritarian system, it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit our culture. It doesn't fit our values. And so that's where you get a lot of this tension between these kinds of more authoritarian churches and movements like Christian nationalism and democratic society at large. And they, of course, they feel persecuted. They're like, why do people oppose us? The values are different. They're so un undemocratic that, that that's where that tension right. comes from. It's not an attempt to persecute any Christians in particular. I mean, what you where you see churches that have a more lateral understanding of authority, a more democratic and espouse more democratic values and ethics, um, you don't see that kind of tension. You don't see that kind mm -hmm. of conflict between the church and the society at large. And that's not to say that 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 those churches that are for the good churches and the authoritarian models of the bad churches, that it's just a it's a recognition of what creates social tension and what doesn't. And right. And the experience of social tension does not somehow justify that church. Oh, they're being persecuted. Therefore, they're fulfilling some, somehow fulfilling God's promise. That's just not how it works. <laughs> we, we, well, we... yeah, I, I, I totally get that. I think we even look at the recent examples. I believe the Oath Keepers and definitely most recently the Proud Boys tried to, uh, to, used as an excuse the fact that their president had told them oh to, yes to so do what they lever did. leveraging the chain of command or authority right. as justification right. for an unethical behavior right. yeah and we can see those extremes we can see those extremes n not only inside the christian nationalist movement but also in those peripheral movements uh, among the you know, far-right militias and we mm -hmm. can also see it in other religious traditions like the people who flew the planes into the towers were following what they believed to be God's will. And, uh, and so w without a lateral understanding of ethics, a lateral understanding of morality, where we're actually looking after what is our neighbor's yeah. health and well-being and what benefits them, we lose our capacity to make sound judgment about ethics. And we cede that authority, that, that personal authority and responsibility that we should have to somebody above us who it doesn't necessarily have our interests in mind either. So one of the, one of the things, someday I'll write an essay maybe, yeah. um, about how certain symbols and words, I think have been hijacked, liberty for one, mm -hmm. and what liberty to Susan's restoring liberty means is a lot different than what what I see. And obviously, if you're looking at just rights in general, rights typically, you can't suddenly create a right that infringes on a pre-existing right. So, you can't suddenly say, I have a right to live in a strictly heterosexual community, <laughs> for mm -hmm. example, if in fact that community is not fully homosexual, heterosexual or something. Yeah. And, and, and that there doesn't appear to be this, like, I, as far as I can tell, citizen restoring liberty doesn't exist for the common good. It's not uh, out to improve infrastructure or, or safety or all those things. But in their mind, I think they, they might argue with that. But I think if we look at this whole faith fest thing and their foothold in it, it might give us yeah. a... Yeah, I would love to talk more about like these different political uh, positions like what the le left right spectrum means as far as policy and law and the history of republicanism and and radicalism and reactionaries all of that probably for another show because i do think we, yes. we should probably at this point get into the the faith fest and why it's a it's a, it's somewhat misnamed it's a political event 
And, uh, and so we're going to just, go, I'm going to go through, I've done some little research, a little bit of research on the speakers here, and I'm going to go through and talk about the, who they are and, uh, and I'll try to be brief. I'll try not to overwhelm people with too much data, but I think it, it's worth knowing that if, if you're thinking about this event, or if you're concerned about this event, knowing what, what it is, what it's about. We have a number of speakers and we have some musicians who are participating, at least they're still participating. They haven't all pulled out yet. Of the musicians, we have Seventh Day Slumber. It's a conservative Christian group. They might be unaware of the political nature of the event. They themselves are bringing Christian music in an evangelical kind of message through their music. But I think even if they were aware, I don't think it would phase them. They're vocal supporters of Donald Trump and believe some conspiracy theories about him. And so mm -hmm. I'm thinking even if they aren't Christian nationalists, they aren't going to recognize Christian nationalism as a threat. They're just not prepared to do that. So that's, mm -hmm. that's seventh day slumber. They do have some positive messaging about self-acceptance and things like that. And, uh, and their music is cool. <laughs> it sounds cool. Anyway. And then you have, you have Bracken Barnett, who is a local band and musician, Christian musician. I'm sure someone local is probably fully aware of the political allegiance of that church and the political nature of the event and probably yeah. don't mind too much. Matt Sassano is on tour as another Christian musician with, he's on tour with Seventh Day Slumber and another group. He's also a conservative Christian musician. He also might be unaware of the political nature of the event, but based on his stated perception that conservatives and Christians are a persecuted class, uh, persecuted class in our society, I doubt that sharing the stage with the likes of Scott Kesterson or Joey Gibson will phase him that much. The interesting one is, is Kevin Carr. I don't know much about Kevin Carr's personal politics. I've reached out to him to ask him and uh -huh. ask about his awareness of the event. But this guy is a this guy's a bagpipe player. He plays the Irish pipes, bagpipes, and he's a storyteller. And he's got this, like really like old hippie vibe to him. And just reviewing his online persona and profile, he seems like a pretty seems like a pretty e easygoing grandpa type guy with a lot of fun, cool, like stories. And I'm mm -hmm. like, how is this guy, how is this guy connected with this event? So I reached out to him. I'll see if he writes back. You mm -hmm. never know, but uh, I'm very interested to find out if he's, if he's familiar with it, what his relationship with it is. Maybe he's part of the whole thing. Maybe that's his game, but I'm very curious to find out. So that's Kevin Carr. Back to the, now to the speakers, we have a couple of very normal, like what I would consider normal evangelical Christian ministries and motivational speakers. One of them is a Salem based homeless outreach ministry called Be Bold Street Ministry. Okay. The founders of it are, I might miss the pronunciations of these folks, but Matt Macera and Josh Lair. And Matt and Josh are both recovering addicts who found their recovery through faith-based recovery programs and and then have then created a faith-based outreach ministry for people experiencing homelessness and people experiencing addiction. And, mm -hmm. and so they do meal programs and birthday parties for people up in Salem. And then they have some degree of national and international outreach through Be Bold Street Ministry, mostly focusing around their testimony as for, as formerly addicted people there in yeah. recovery and, yeah. and how their faith helped them escape that. And that's pretty standard, pretty normal stuff. They have the, they, they have the, the kind of cultural signif signifiers of masculinity and conservatism in terms of how they address and things like that. But Nothing I heard in researching them suggests that they're going to be, that they're in line with the likes of Joey Gibson or things like that. So okay. that's Be Bold Ministry. And then we have this couple, they're motivational speakers, faith-based motivational speakers named, let me find my notes, Brad and Autumn Heeren. 
Brad and Autumn Heron are they're Christian motivational ministers. They're somewhat connected to Rover Ministries. He's a, a Rover was a, a survivor of a grin, grenade attack, I think, in Vietnam, and then he had to ha have a lot of reconstructive surgery. Oh. And he's developed support systems for veterans who've wounded veterans and motivational programs for people who've been through that kind of physical trauma. Brad himself uh, was uh, fell into addiction early in his life, and he began cooking meth in his car. And at one point, his meth lab in his car exploded while he was in it and it left him with very severe burns. He very nearly died. And so he's um, survived that, recovered with a lot of reconstructive surgery and skin grafts for the severe burns all over his body. And he then is now a motivational speaker and talks about how his faith has helped him overcome that. Um, his wife, Autumn, survived a chemical, ac a chemical lab accident and she talks about how her faith has helped her overcome that and her overcome her feelings of you know, how our society frames value and beauty and how her faith and her how she finds her strength and self-worth in her heart and in her mm -hmm. relationship with god so these are both like i would consider to be very normal and very rooted in faith kinds of speakers and and not at all what you would consider Christian nationalist. And I think that's an example of how Christian nationalist events like Faith Fest are trying to mainstream the fringe views that are going to be platformed at that festival with what other people would consider to be comfortable, normal Christian ministry kinds of speakers. So you're going to be uh -huh. blending something that people consider normal with something that's fringe and people will start to accept both as normal. And that's where we get into some of the weirdness. I'm going to first talk about Scott Kesterson. Scott Kesterson is a far right Christian nationalist and he is a prominent QAnon conspiracy theorist. He runs a small production company promoting warrior culture and the principles mm -hmm. of con conviction, righteousness and ruthlessness. Uh, emphasis on that ruthlessness. Uh, he promotes election conspiracies, COVID-related conspiracies, anti-immigration views, currency conspiracy theories, the gold standard only, and of course the QAnon conspiracy theory. Kesterson is, uh, you know, he goes on far-right radio shows and talks about these kinds of things with his Christian nationalist and other far-right buds. And promotes this kind of perspective on Jesus as a warrior, and creates a, a, a what do you call it? Fosters a culture of violence, I think, around around masculinity and and faith. Oh. I think it's really interesting concerning that that ruthlessness is considered one of the values or principles that he's promoting. It doesn't seem to me to square with things that, like, for example, Jesus saying, blessed are the meek, or yeah. it doesn't seem to square with love your enemies, do good to those who persecute you. It doesn't seem to square with if your enemy strikes you on the right cheek, turn him to turn to him the left. Yeah. Off. That's right. a, it's a very different, would, I would consider it's a mentality that this is true for all Christian nationalism as a Christian heresy. It's a mentality and approach to the gospel and the story of Jesus that is very antithetical to who he was and what his message was. And in addition, I, mean, I don't want to do the whole thing of muckraking, but I think it's worth noting that Scott Kesterson pled guilty to felony theft in Colorado in 2017. Back in 2013, a friend of his, his was dying of cancer in Colorado. She, I think she had leukemia and her family were struggling to raise um, money for their medical bills. And then also money for, in concern that if she died, that her family would have something. And so Scott Kesterson organized a fundraiser and 
in 2014, sadly, she passed away and the family started to wonder, where did these thousands of dollars that Scott raised go? And her husband called him up and he made some excuses and the husband called him up again and he made some excuses and the husband called him up again and he just stopped taking the calls. So thousands of dollars of that fundraiser never made it to the family and they went to the law. And Scott ended up being extradited to Colorado. He pled guilty and he had to pay $19,000 extradition fees plus plus uh, the money that he owed the Restoration, family. Restoration, yeah. Sounds like George Santos. Yeah, yeah. Um, So in terms of the kinds of people who are being platformed here at Faith Fest, we're not necessarily looking at people who, you know, at least in terms of of the Christian nationalists, I don't want to speak ill of Brad and Autumn Heron or Be Bold Mm -hmm. Ministries, but but I'm feeling pretty comfortable speaking ill of the Christian nationalists and uh, QAnon conspiracy theorists. In this case... We're not seeing paragons of integrity here. We're seeing people who are willing to grift and willing to lie. And I think that's one of the characteristics of people in the Christian nationalist movement is you do see conspiracy theories, con artists and grifters just running through that circuit because they're not going to be doing, their audience isn't critical thinkers. They're not doing, they're not challenging what they're hearing from the people that are being platformed as much as they're being taught to challenge the normative voices they might be hearing in society. So, so that's a concern. Let's move on to Paul Cantrell. Not much on Paul Cantrell. He's not a very significant person in terms of that I can find in terms of his involvement, other than he's also involved in Oregon right wing politics. He's connected with, and I think the reason why he's platformed is his connections with an organization called Free Oregon which is a 501c4 organization founded by Ben, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, Edel. Ben Edel is an anti-mask activist, former Mm -hmm. GOP state Senate candidate. He blamed Black Lives Matter, anti-fascist activists and state regulations for his Portland businesses failing during the COVID-19 pandemic. And so he went on to found Free Oregon as an organization that states it's a civil rights organization and then spends most of its activity either organizing against or openly suing the state over mask mandates, vaccine (laughs) mandates, policies favoring transgender student rights, gun regulations, and elections politics, or policies, I should say. So right now, we've we've talked about the two faith-based speakers, and now we've got Scott and Paul as two political speakers. And then I'm going to move on to... Vance Day. Uh, Vance <laughs> Day is a. Do you, I don't. You, you might have. Heard, he's been in the news. He's been around for a yeah. while. Vance Day is a former Marion County judge who was suspended from the bench for ethical violations. He served as chairman of the Young Republicans in 1992. Later became a treasurer and eventually chairman of the Oregon Republican Party. Um, he was appointed to the Marion County Circuit Court in 2011 by Governor Kitzhaber. During his tenure, he made some pretty serious errors in judgment, as well as committed several ethical violations. He made national news in 2015 for refusing to perform same-gender weddings. His method of avoiding performing same-gender weddings was he instructed his staff to review applications to check if the couple was gay, and then if they were gay, he told them to tell them that he was not available on their scheduled date and to find another judge, which is, it's basically dishonesty, which is an ethical violation. He was investigated prior to his refusal to perform in these weddings. He was already under investigation for ethical violations and that was added to them. And ultimately his, the investigations resulted in criminal charges related to providing a felon with a firearm and those charges were dropped when a key witness didn't show, but he still was suspended from the bench for his ethical violations. He remains an attorney and he represents the Oregon Republican Party in certain cases, including a recent case where they tried to sue the Oregon state legislator to try to prevent a bill that protects abortion access for women. Vance Day is, I would, I think of him as he's been Christian faith has been central to his, 
his self-understanding and his and his activity since I think probably the 70s or whenever it was he became a Christian but his public life has almost is has invariably been political and uh, and so I think that while he's probably a person like like Rod Taylor of genuine faith he's a political person he's a political personality and his invitation and his platform here at the faith fest event is a it's a political platform and of course then his questionable integrity and here's the thing i was re re reviewing his ethical violations and things like that <laughs> this guy is just making he doesn't think about his actions he's got that kind of boomer masculine confidence where he doesn't think about the consequences of his actions or its impact on others he thinks he's in the right because his intentions are good and if he has good intentions that somehow justifies what he does which is of course that's just not how that's not how christian ethics works folks right. intentions don't justify you <laughs> any more than right. than actions or works like let's be clear about something here in christian christianity if you're talking about work-based justification you're on the wrong track but um but so, vance has let, good let intentions me, and he makes dumb decisions <laughs> so i have a i i have a question that brings to mm -hmm. mind like like um i've i've been documenting lies told by rod taylor and mm -hmm. some of those lies could have been reckless disregard for the truth. And some of those lies may just be ignorance. But there's there does seem to be this willingness. Yeah, um, yeah. I saw that to, with Vance to Day just, too. Yeah, this willingness to just not be honest. <laughs> right. Oh. It's because the the understanding seems to be that i'm in the right place in terms of where i should be and i'm doing the right things in terms of what i believe to be right and therefore if i'm going to be challenged by this position or that position or accused of this or that i'm just going to brush those aside with a quick explanation or excuse and that's what happened with vance with his eth ethical violations was he made errors of judgment and he, you know he made irresponsible decisions and then he tried to casually accidentally lie in his kind of excuse for just well let's just clear this out of the way that's no big deal but his pattern of behavior was to not take responsibility and not to acknowledge like that he'd erred and and not, and then there there's no, no corrective action taken so this avoidance of accountability and you just can't have that with a judge and you right. honestly, like when we're talking about our people who have a voice in our community, who, who take leadership, we want to be people of integrity. We want to hope that the other people that we're listening to and letting uh, be our leaders are people of integrity. And when we goof up, we should be taking responsibility rather than becoming defensive and reactive. And we should try to correct those errors. My, 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 my personal hope is that we operate with caution and grace when we're talking about these kinds of things. If I'm going to mm -hmm. say something bad about Scott Kesterson or Vance Day, I want to know that I got that from somebody else who did the research or I did the research myself. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm, information I'm getting about Vance is from uh, article, news articles and from a re review of the ethical violations that he was investigated mm -hmm. for. So it's just a summary of what I'm seeing here with Vance. I'm not that concerned with, I, like, I, I think Vance is just typical Republican, <laughs> but yeah. he's an example. He's in a, not in a bad way. I meant in a good way. And it, he's a classic Republican guy, Republican mm -hmm. values, principles, that kind of thing. He's a political person now. He's a political personality and he's being platformed at Faith Fest which is really a political event disguised as a Christian event. And I think that's consistent with Christian nationalism, taking that guys. And I think it's interesting that I th that Vance Day is currently involved in the efforts of Christian nationalists and the, the far right political takeover of the uh, Republican party. He seems to be, seems to have no problem with that and seems to be a willing ally <clears throat> and open it in elite in open allegiance to it. 
Yeah. And then, and then we also have Joey Gibson. Joey Gibson, of course, people who might be familiar with him because of his past, he was here before for the last one. He's a, uh -huh. Joey Gibson is an interesting character because his personal, at least the way he expresses his personal views and beliefs would place him as a conservative libertarian extremist. He, his relationships and allegiances though, his partnerships tend to be all conservative authoritarians. And so it's very strange for a conservative libertarian extremist to be allied with and associated with so many authoritarians. But I think the way to reconcile that is to recognize that conservatism itself, the way it sets law is that the law, that there's a special group of people and the law protects them, but doesn't constrain them. Yeah. And then there's this, the, other, the out, so that's the in group. And then the out group, the law constrains them, but doesn't protect them. And authoritarians, that's how they model the law. The law is going to protect the people that it wants to empower but it's not going to restrain them in any way. It's going to let them use that power as they see fit. And then mm -hmm. everyone else under them, the law is going to restrain them, but it won't protect them from the authoritarian. So that kind of inherent yeah. social inequality and conservative libertarians are fine with that as long as they're in the in group. And I think that's where Joey Gibson and his kind of Western chauvinist kind of perspective, as well as Christian, his Christian nationalist perspective means he's going to be in the in group. He's a man, he's a Christian, that's the in-group mentality. So he's got this liber libertarian mentality for himself and then an authoritarian mentality for everyone who disagrees with him. Mm -hmm. And he's the founder of a right-wing Christian nationalist gang called Patriot Prayer. He began his activism in support of Donald Trump in 2016. He ran for U.S. Senate, Senate in Washington as a Republican in 2018. And then in his capacity as leader of Patriot Prayer, he's been involved in street brawls against anti-fascist activists yeah. Yeah. Uh, he has de tepidly disavowed white supremacy he himself has irish and japanese ancestry but patriot pair rallies frequently draw participation from white nationalists from neo-nazis violent militias and western chauvinists identity europa white nationalist group has been there stormer book club neo-nazi true cascadia neo-nazi ram oath keepers free, three percenters and of course the proud boys Members of Patriot Prayer and participants in their rallies have been involved in politically motivated felony violence, Tiny Toese, seditious conspiracy against the United States, a guy named Ethan something, I can't remember, just recently convicted of seditious conspiracy, and of course, and most scarily, murder. A Jeremy Christian, who stabbed two people on the MAX train, was attracted right. to a Patriot yeah. Prayer rally. To, in, in, to his credit, the Patriot Prayer people did ask him to leave that rally, uh, but but the fact that the, the, that those rallies are attracting people like that in the first place shows mm -hmm. the kind of character of this political movement. Yeah. Joey Gibson will probably use the Bible verses and things when he speaks. He's a political he's a political figure. So we have, out of the six speakers, we have four political speakers. Oh, I hmm. forgot to talk about Dr. I don't know how to pronounce his name for sure. Wandwasen Tefera. Dr. Wandwasen Tefera is kind of an enigma. I don't know where he fits in the platform. He is an Ethiopian born Oregon based personality. Beyond hmm. that, I don't know what he really is. It's very difficult to find anything more about him. And I don't know to what degree uh, Dan Wilson or, or Restoration Worship Center did any background or credential check on him or how they know him. I looked him up and found that at most his name is associated with about six businesses in Oregon. We have Tefera Adult Foster Homes in Happy Valley. There's a residential address for that business, but there's no business signage and there's no online presence for that business. That's a current business. Horizon Adult Group Home in Clackamas has three residential addresses with that business. No business signage for that. No online presence. Both of those have the same mailing address, um, which is a commercial address. And it's the exact same one between them. 
one of those three residential addresses associated with Horizon Adult Group Homes is also the same address associated, same, one of the same addresses associated with Tefera Adult Group Homes. Okay. And then he has Portland Superior Cleaning LLC, which is an inactive business in Portland. So that one's been inactive for a while. Clear Vision Consulting and Training LLC in Clackamas has the same business address listed for Tefera Adult Foster Care Homes as and so this address is being used ostensibly to run yeah. an adult foster care with no signage and a, uh -huh. a clear vision consulting and training with no signage and again no online presence for this business either no website no nothing and then in addition to those businesses he has new beginning international ministry in clackamas which is registered again with the same address and no signage, no online presence. And that's really weird. It's really weird for a ministry, uh, 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 and especially in an, an international ministry, not to have a website, to not have any kind of like online presence like that. In addition to that, he has international, so he has New Beginning International Ministry in Clackamas, same address, and then International Restoration Ministries, also in Clackamas, registered with the mailing address associated with the other businesses. So the other businesses have a commercial address as their mailing address, and then residential addresses as their business address. And then International Restoration Ministries uses that mailing address as its business address, and then uses the business address as its mailing address. <laughs> And so it's yeah. very confusing. No online presence for any of these businesses. No indication that they're actually functioning and providing services or if they have any employees and no signage in at their addresses. Another interesting note is the business name used by Tefera for his international restoration ministries is almost exactly the same as that used by a person from Bandon in the early 2000s, a man named Dan Wilson. And... Uh, I can find no websites associated with any of the businesses. The whole strangeness of it all is, it's confusing. <laughs> and then so, he's built, he, okay, go ahead. I'm going to uh, say more about him, but you have a question. I have a question. Uh, this international ministries. Now I know on the um, band and restoration worship center international, they list something I think it's Kenya. Something that they've done in Kenya. For some reason, their their links, their menus, aren't working, so I can't actually get to that page for some reason. Yeah. But in the past, I've looked at it. And they, I don't know, made one trip or mm -hmm. sent some money or something to. Um, yeah, it's. That's, that's is that what normal. qualifies them as international? No, I don't know to what degree Restoration Worship Center is connected with a, a registered right. international ministry or what that, I don't know what their relationship with Tefera is. I'm guessing there's some kind of relationship there because he's a speaker at their event and I don't know how yeah. else he would be connected with them. But again, I can't find any indication online that any of these businesses actually function in the way that that they're like a they're, business they're, they're, yeah, yeah like a business it's so that's confusing in addition he's billed on the faith fest event as someone who has the capacity for healing and prophecy so i mean that there i have a whole lot of skepticism skepticism around this speaker just because of the open questions about his credentials about his background and about what's yeah. going on there yeah i don't know to what degree faith restoration worship center did the the background on him and make sure that they have full confidence in him or yeah. or if they might be putting someone in on a platform who doesn't actually have the yeah the credentials or isn't who he says he is or whatever it might be I'm very curious about these businesses. I want to know if they got PPE loans during the pandemic. I want to know how many, whether, I want to know all of this stuff, but I haven't had the time to do the research. So I so, actually downloaded all of the SBA raw data for Oregon. Okay. Um, and I did do a, I, I filtered everything and got just Coos County. Um, I didn't even think to look whether restoration 
on anything or any of other past yeah on this <laughs> yeah this tefera guy I don't that's such, he's got so many open questions for who he yeah. is and what he's involved in that i'm just yeah. i don't know how he i don't know what it, his platform is when he gets up to speak i don't know if he's going to be speaking christian nationalism or if he's going to be speaking like more of a charismatic christian spiritual gifts kind of message or if he's going to do a discussion of his history of his own personal background and things like that and growing up in ethiopia leaving there and coming to the u.s i don't know what his story is going to be yeah it's an inter it's an interesting addition to the lineup i'll say that for sure and if i go to the event if i go to the event i'll be paying close attention <laughs> okay. um, but yeah that's the lineup for this event we've got uh, we've got a bunch of um we've got four four overtly political right-wing political speakers we've got two pretty normative christian evangelical speakers and we've got one kind of an odd stands out as we're not sure what he is speaker huh. Huh. that's interesting what do you recommend then as far as attending or oh like, i think observing yeah, I, or what i've reached out to to mr carr about by the pipe player to find out if he's aware of the political nature of the event and to ask uh -huh. him but you know about that I'm reaching out to some of the other the vendors that are involved to find out what their position is. But I think transparency is where we're at right now. We're talking about it here on our show. We're aware that mm -hmm. this is this event is part of an anti-democratic movement in our community and uh, and leveraging religion as the vehicle to accomplish it. And uh, and so I think people should be aware whether or not there's an organized protest of the event this year there was 2 years ago for the Faith Family Freedom Rally that they held with QAnon speakers and Joey Gibson and other, that kind of thing. I don't know if that's gonna happen. I'm not organizing anything like that. Um, yeah. Whether or not people want to attend personally to investigate and ex experience like firsthand what this kind of thing is, that's up to you, whether people with religious trauma probably want to avoid it. But here's what I would expect if I was the prophetic sort, and I'm not. But if I, was, if I was going to predict what we're going to see is I think we're going to see very, very normal, basic kind of evangelical ABCs of salvation kind of stuff from the pulpit. You're a sinner. If you accept that you're a sinner, accept Jesus in your heart, you'll be saved and you'll go to heaven as long as you remain obedient and loyal to him for the rest of your life. And don't fuck it up. Oh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that on our platform. Will the FCC get me in trouble? Anyway, sorry. But I think what we'll also see is very hyper masculine, pro masculine kinds of displays yeah. of a uh, of faith. Christian nationalism does, I think, worship masculinity and traditional Western culture more yeah. than it worships or has any affinity for Jesus and his message. I think what we'll see is a lot of promotion of the gender binary, masculinism, and chauvinism and traditional western cultural kind of perspectives you didn't uh, conservat mention, and conservatism you didn't mention pastor dan wilson he's speaking at no i didn't a. didn't actually research him okay and uh, maybe over time we'll get more time for that i was looking at the guest speakers and i did looking at the lineup list and he's not on the lineup list it does list restoration worship center on the lineup but it looked at they look their worship band was performing so i didn't even think of pastor dan yeah but i, I huh. imagine he'll fall under our scrutiny at some point <laughs> um yeah i under i understand that some of the food truck court or whatever it's called some of them have decided once they found out what it was about they opted to drop out so, no. I, be, but i don't know asking. I yeah. don't know which ones. I mean, well, so, talking, somebody, yeah. Yeah, I'll talk to the, I, I'm scheduled to talk to the plate tomorrow to find out what their perspective is on it. Oh, okay. We'll find out. Okay, but anyway, and that's my, my, my done, review. Which was excellent. I, I have <laughs> to ask you, as a former pastor, mm -hmm. 
what's with this stark moonscape, black and white, apocalyptic? It just doesn't... Oh, so we're looking at their website, the Faith Fest yeah. promotional website. The yeah. black and white. Yeah. It just looks... It looks I mean, like a I desert think... wilderness. It looks like a Isn't desert that... wilderness or maybe a snowy Isn't that mountain. The matter... It looks like a moonscape. Like... It does. That does look like snow there. It's hard to... It's uh, It creates a visual vibe. The black and white, the stark black and white creates a, I think, a very... How would you call it? It doesn't seem it's very, festive. It's very, very it in your face. Seem... No, it's not festive. Trying to interpret this, there's a lot of ways it could go. It, it, the visual representation suggests some kind of challenge. We're looking at mountains here. We're climbing a mountain, or we're facing some kind of obstacle or barrier to overcome. Okay. So we're looking at we're looking at speakers who are talking about overcoming addiction overcoming serious physical injury and then we of course we have the christian nationalists who will be speaking about overcoming the left the liberals and the secular right. society and all of that and so i think that's probably what the visual the visuals here are trying to create is this sense of a start a barrier a land a barren landscape, a barrier, and then promoting the faith as the the vehicle by which one overcomes that. And that's what I would how I would interpret it. Um, I think it's I don't the know Matterhorn. That it's, it could be. I don't know that it's yeah. apocalyptic. I do think that p apocalypticism is part of their religious tradition, but uh, but I don't know that the imagery itself there is supposed to convey that. I don't know. It's just, it's just how it strikes me. Yeah. But, um, In, the and black it, and white aesthetics is very consistent with the kind of, for example, the kind of music that they're going to be well, promoting. And the, and the blocky be, font, it just... Yeah. It's it a looks, harder edge, very masculine yeah, kind of appearance. Yeah, it looks more yeah. sinister, like you're going to to, uh, to watch The Omen at the theater or something. I don't know. <laughs> but... but um, I don't know. I don't. I try not to. I try not to uh, interpret things negatively unless there's no other way. But um, I could. A, I could. Such a sweet person. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but I, I could see the. I could see it's stark black and white quality and uh, harshness to to be off putting. I can see that. Um, but I can see how it. I can see how it'd be appealing to a, a, a certain. From a certain perspective, I can see how it could be appealing. Uh, particularly, um, particularly towards men. Yeah, yeah, the mucho macho, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, talk toxic masculinity thing. We are at almost one hour and twenty minutes. Yeah, it's been quite. A we long. we do not run out of stuff to say. I've got to say that. <laughs> yeah, some of these projects we've working on are major assignments for me. I've been spending like sometimes yeah. ten hours a week on them. Oh wow. wow! What I thought was just going to be a little hobby project has been almost like another job. <laughs> I, I'm really grateful to you. So grateful, and and the perspective that you bring is very enlightening and informative for me. And I, I hope our audience feels the same way. And thanks. When we get a little, I think we're getting closer. When we go live. We'll find out in the comment yeah. section. Yeah. So. I feel like when we, we when we post these, if anyone who's actually watching all the way through to one nineteen minutes into the show, yeah. if you have questions, if you have topics you want us to cover, any of that, please comment them. We're actually, you know, very interested in your input and we're very interested in your right. perspectives. Yeah, absolutely. All right. I wanna thank Israel and everyone who's watching and we'll be back next week mm -hmm. yeah right. thanks so much we'll see you later thanks.